is Gynecologic Surgeons Unscrubbed, a series-based podcast focusing on surgical and medical education and featuring expert interviews and practice-changing discussion. Our host is Dr. Kara King, a member of the Cleveland Clinic's section of minimally invasive gynecologic surgery. Dr. King is also the director of benign gynecologic surgery and associate program director of the Cleveland Clinic's MIGS Fellowship. This podcast is a collaboration between MD Edge and the Society of Gynecologic Surgeons. We'll be right back after this message. This podcast is made possible by Boston Scientific. To learn more about Boston Scientific, please visit bostonscientific.com. The opinions expressed in this podcast belong solely to the featured clinicians and do not necessarily reflect the views of Boston Scientific. So we are coming to you today from Vancouver, uh, where we are at the annual AEGL conference. Uh, we have Dr. Javier Magrina joining us this morning. He is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology and Barbara Woodward Lips Professor at Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona. He is fellowship trained in gynecologic oncology. Dr. Magrina is a recipient of countless teaching awards, endless publications, including his most recent achievement, which is the 2019 John Stagey Mentorship Award given to him just this past week in Vancouver. You've been extremely influential in countless people's lives, and we are very grateful to have you here with us this morning. So welcome, Dr. Magrina. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you for having me here. We are thrilled. So like I said, we are in the exhibit hall right now, so people may come up to us and chat. So um, we have questions during the show. We'll take those as well. So I do want to get into our main discussion point, which is going to be about obstetrics and gynecology training, separating the O from the G. But I want to start out by talking about your journey that brought you to where you are today. So, Dr. Magrino, where did you grow up? I grew up in the uh, Mediterranean in uh, Barcelona, Spain. Wow. Over the pond? Over the pond. And I ended up practicing in the middle of the desert in Arizona. <laughs> Beautiful. You, Beautiful if somebody, area. If somebody would have said when I was a kid, they said, okay, you are going to end up in the desert in Arizona, and you'll be working at the place that's called the Mayo Clinic. And I said... No, I'm not going to the desert, <laughs> and there is no Mayo Clinic in there, so you guys are wrong. You're wrong on two accounts. So always be prepared for the unexpected. It's a good lesson. And accept it when you think that that's the appropriate thing to do. Yeah. And um, gynecologic oncology, did you always know that you wanted to be a pelvic surgeon, or how did that path take you? It started when I was in medical school. There was a, a friend of our family who was a gynecologist, and he said, any time you have a free time, you're welcome to work with me. So of the OB and GYN, my main interest became obviously GYN. So I was, by the time I finished medical school, basically, I almost knew how to do a hysterectomy. Wow. At least I thought. Now I know <laughs> that I didn't. But at least I thought at that time. And then I ended up saying, go into GYN because that's what I had already dedicated. And he was a good mentor, a good role model that I actually wanted to be like him. I see. It's important to have good role models, and I definitely yeah. want to get into that more in detail with you later on in our show, because you've been such um, an exemplary example of how to be a mentor, how to be a sponsor, um, and so I can see how that, that carried with you throughout good. your career. Yeah. Okay. So are you ready to dive into O separating from the G? Anytime. <laughs> so the first time I actually heard you discuss this topic, was at your AAGL presidential speech back in 2013, and it generated a lot of discussion back then, right? So 2019, it, we're still talking about it, but nothing has shifted too much in regard to training. Talk to me about the limitations of a current obstetrics and gynecology training program, and why do you think it benefits separating these two subspecialties, or these two specialties, I should so, say. So uh, if, you if you may allow me to take you back a little earlier. I would love that. It, it was a separate in 18, 1889, that's about 130 years ago. They created it as a single specialty, obstetrics and gynecology. So then you have 130 years of evolution and nothing has changed. Right. But probably at that time it was a good idea because the, the knowledge was very limited. The number of procedures probably that would mean there was only one or two. Now, 130 years later, the knowledge has increased. The number of surgical procedures has increased dramatically, but we're still keeping it together. And the emphasis perpetuates. ACOG is 58 or 60 years 
all 68 years old, I believe. Yeah. So, and it still perpetuates the concept. ACGME is still enforces primary care in the OBGYNs, and the American, uh, another Congress of OBGYN, American Congress of OBGYN also in 2017 said, primary health care is the integral part of an OBGYN practice. So we're just so dilute. So they're telling us we have to be primary care physicians, as well as obstetricians, as well as GYN surgeons. And so it's just not enough time, right? You're right. Yeah. That's correct. And back 30 years ago, doing a hysterectomy, there was one way to do a hysterectomy, right? An open right. procedure. And now we have vaginal. Well, we had vaginal back then, too, didn't we? We did vaginal, vaginal. too. Vaginal. The but late 1800s. Exactly. Was that our? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then robotic, straight stick single port. There's all these different ways to do a hysterectomy, so numbers. Tell me about, um, what's the average number of hysterectomies that a general gynecologist does in a year? In uh, The number for 2010 was 8.5. So think about it that would any mother go to an obstetrician that says, I'm a low volume obstetrician and in surgery low volume is defined as less than 10 a year. High volume is 50, more than 50 a year, okay. which is about one a week. So if you take that less than 10 and the mother says, yeah, I deliver 8.5 babies a year, no mother would go to... No, you don't, and, s- you don't see enough to be prepared. Right, and probably maybe ACOC would not allow it, but they are allowing to do something which to me is more complex than the delivery, which is the hysterectomies and hyster- and procedures that they're done in the uh, operating room. That's an interesting way of looking at it. So from the lens of obstetrics, not nearly enough numbers. Right. But from lens of gynecologic surgery, which can be complex, somehow that seems like enough. Correct. That seems enough. So it's okay. Low volume surgery is okay. And in the um, Mass General Harbor, they had a publication where they have 85 GYN surgeons. And of the 85, only eight of them, 10%, are high volume. The vast majority are low volume. Wow. And when they look at the results, obviously there is a difference in results that you have like this. Right. As long as they are permitted to operate, they will continue to operate. If I may take you back to another, why do people go into the OBGYN? when the medical students that we have at Mayo, some of them says, no, I, I like to go into OBGYN. And then it says, why? Oh, because you can do a lot of different things. And I go like, no, 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 no. no this no. is the wrong <laughs> way to think about practicing. Yeah. If you are an athlete, you're going to play only soccer, for instance, and you're going to play also on the same position every single game. Right. You're right. You get really good at that one thing. So, can I take it even farther? I want it. Because imagine that you are an athlete, okay? Soccer. Mm -hmm. Plays on the same position. Offensive all the time. Right or left. Mm -hmm. Never changes. Mm -hmm. All right? They go on training for years. They start at the beginning doing a little bit of a few minutes on a game. They realize they have potential. They finally play on a game. And then they finally play on the top games that they are. What do they do in between the games? Deliberate practice. They practice. And what do they have in addition to practice? Coaching. A coach. 100%. They have coaching till the last game they do in their lives. Mm-hmm. So I'm taking you back to the training. You finish your surgical training, which we can talk later, but it's still not adequate. Then you go and practice. You only play 8.5 times a year. You don't have any practice in between those times because you're busy in practice delivering babies. And then you're supposed to... Perform at your highest. Exactly. Doesn't seem sustainable. And you lose your coaching. Mm-hmm. You have no coaching after you finish your training. Who's going to coach you or even after the fellowship? Mm-hmm. Unless you take it yourself to coach yourself and go to meetings and watch what they're doing. You, you're not going to have. Mm-hmm. So coaching is one of, one of my passions. And you could even argue that coming to a meeting 
watching videos, going to plenaries, that's not even really coaching, right? That's you absorbing and trying to learn, but that's not personal coaching for your personal technique, your efficiency, your team building. That's, that's not even actually coaching, right? Correct, and it's not the same as somebody that says, look, this is what you need to improve. Okay, let's see how you do this the next time. Okay, no, you still have to improve it. That's the coaching. Exactly, video review. And not just your technique, but even in the operating room itself, right? Like, what's your team doing? How are you, what you, how are you using your assistant? You're so right. It's not just, and who do you even bring to the OR, right? So it may, it may even be more important who you're bringing to the OR and who you're not on top of your surgical skill. It's just so many layers of complexity. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And we, we come to accept that that's the way it is and that's the way we practice. And nothing is done unless there is enough people that they come up and say, look, we, we want to do something. Cleveland Clinic has started a program already separating to some degree the two practices. And you can probably talk to me about more because you yeah, are there. I am. Not me. So. And I'd actually love to talk to you about that. So, so you're right. We have an OBGYN tracking program. And what that means is that we have certain rotations that the residents have to complete. And then they have um, flex months where they can add whatever type of specialty work that they want. So I actually ran the numbers before this today to figure out what a general OBGYN residency looks like in regard to GYN and obstetric months versus the tracking program that we have where if somebody tracked all of their flex months to GYN, what would that look like? And what it looked like is general OBGYN residency programs have about 17 months dedicated to gynecology and 31 months dedicated to obstetrics. And that's the average general OBGYN program in the country. With a tracking residency program, if somebody tracked all of their months into GYN, they can get up to 25 months of GYN and 23 months of obstetrics. So with tracking, we definitely increase our numbers, and I see a difference in the operating room. You do it. And plus, our, our simulation program is really excellent, too. Yeah. We do a lot of cadaver work. But if you do dedicated practice and separate it out, I do see a difference in, in the graduates. Congratulations yeah. for being pioneers. <laughs> it happened before, long before I got there, but it's, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's teamwork for sure. So one question that I hear a lot when this topic comes up is if we separate the obstetrics from the gynecology, how does this look in more rural settings, right? And abroad, in countries that may not have the physicians or the, the bandwidth to, to separate this out. What are your thoughts about that? Let's take it back to other specialties to see how the other specialties are doing. The OBGYN is a specialty where you have a patient with pelvic pain. Mm -hmm. It's a medical issue. You have to work out this patient, and then you may end up that she needs surgery or she doesn't need surgery. And if she needs surgery, you are the one that's going to be doing it. Let's take, for instance, the gastroenterologist or the GI surgeons. The GI surgeon does not see a patient that goes with him directly for abdominal pain. The GI surgeon receives the patient that the gastroenterologist has evaluated the abdominal pain medically mm -hmm. and says you need to have your gallbladder removed or you need to have your diaphragmatic hernia fixed because you have a reflux right. and sends it to the surgeon. Right. So the surgeon performs only the function of a surgeon. Right. So the medical and the surgical specialties in GYN need to be separated. Mayo Clinic mm -hmm. has had this forever. Right. In, in Arizona, we have the medical gynecologists. They operate minors if they like to, mm -hmm. but no majors. And all the surgeons that we are, we're all subspecialty trained. That's awesome. So that if you come to me and says, I have a prolapse, and I said, no, I'm not going to operate your prolapse. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you to somebody else. And I think this, it makes us better in the sense because we only do one thing. We only play one sport in the same position instead of right. several. Right. That behind separating the offer and the G, yeah. that's what I think the future is. To create an individual that's so hyper-specialized mm -hmm. that is going to get is going to get the best care mm -hmm. than an individual that does many other things. You may need somebody at the entrance door that is going to do medical gynecology, mm -hmm. but that gynecologist is going to decide, hey, you need to go and see that person because that's it. Mm -hmm. High volume, focused niche. I agree, patients do better that way. And there's studies looking at high volume outcomes, patients do better. Yeah. Right. And for many other diseases, 
for instance, like uh, cancer. Uh, in the Swedish had an excellent model. If you have a GYN cancer diagnosed in Sweden mm -hmm. by any gynecologist, you are going to go to one of seven centers specialized mm -hmm. on gynecologic cancer. You can go to any hospital you want. Mm -hmm. So the concept that, hey, I want to go to any hospital because I want to stay in my place, in, in my town, I want to be in there, it's not good for that patient that wants to stay in their own town. It's mm -hmm. almost educating the people, says, look, right. you need to go to a place that they're highly specialized in what you need. Right. And they're going to give you better results. Right. So I think we can learn from other people that already adopted yeah. this, but the trend has to start at some point. Yeah. Yeah. And changing that, that, that mindset and that culture is, is the hard part. It's the hard part. Change is always difficult. It is. It hurts a little bit in the beginning. Yes. But it's, but it's best for our patients, and that's why we're all here. So it makes sense. So in regard to these rural settings where there might not be the bandwidth of physicians there to take care of these patients, on the Twitter world, we brought this up a couple months ago when you presented this at the Opened Endoscopy Forum. And Dr. Louise King started a discussion about this, and I thought it was really interesting. So Dr. Louise King is a minimally invasive GYN surgeon by training. She also has her JD um, and focuses in medical ethics. And she brought up the point that only 50 years ago, general surgeons and neurologists operated in the pelvis. And she brought up the thought of what's stopping us from incorporating general surgeons and neurologists to help with these complex pelvic surgeries in areas that they may not have a GYN who's hyper-specialized in that. What are your thoughts about incorporating other subspecialties to help with pelvic surgery? You take care of a disease, not of a procedure. In, in GYN oncology, we do, I do resections, rectal sigmoid resections, needed for ovarian cancer, which is the same operation that a colorectal will do for colon cancer. But I will not ever operate on somebody that has a diagnosis of rectal cancer because mm -hmm. I don't know anything about colon cancer. Mm -hmm. How do you diagnose it? What's right. your resection margin? Uh, how do you follow up the patients? Right. How often? Do, how many colonoscopies you have to do a year? You need to know the disease if you want to operate. And I do see it in many places, for instance, on endometriosis, mm -hmm. that they call a colorectal surgeon right. to remove a rectus sigmoid involved with endometriosis with a stricture. And they do the same operation, resecting the entire mesentery that they do for colorectal cancer, when the only thing you need is to remove the segment of sigmoid and leave the mesentery intact, lower complication rate. So it is a wrong concept in my mind to bring somebody that knows nothing about the disease because they'll do something that may be totally inappropriate. Really good point. So as surgeons, we're not just technicians. Correct. You need to know about the disease. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in ovarian cancer, when do you operate? When do you give chemotherapy? When can you do the resection? There's so many nuances mm -hmm. that if you are an OBGYN in a small town and you bring a general surgeon, he may not even know that you need to remove the entire disease right. to get the best results. You're right. And at the Cleveland Clinic, we do obviously a lot of advanced endometriosis, a lot of you know diaphragmatic and outside the pelvis endometriosis. But we sometimes do need to recruit in an, another team to help us, right? Um, yeah. Cardiothoracic surgeon. I know you do your own pericardial work, which is beautiful. My favorite videos are from you. But even to your point, when we recruit other surgeons to come in, we still own the disease, right? So the GYNs are still in the operating room the whole time directing how to handle the endometriosis. So Correct. even if it's on an organ that we may not feel comfortable operating on, we still should own that pathophys and help direct that other surgeon and how to manage it. So to your point, I absolutely agree. Yep. It's important. And if you call upon them, for instance, I will have thoracic surgeon with me sometimes when patients have symptomatology that may indicate that there is disease in the chest because they'll go through the ribs and they'll do a thoracoscopy, they'll do a VETS procedure. Mm -hmm. It tells me there is more mm -hmm. that is their territory right. to remove. Right. But then I'll do the rest through the abdomen. That, I think, when you are in the territory that is mm -hmm. a surgeon, you have not been trained, mm -hmm. then you need to ask for help. But better than asking for help is before knowing who would be the best surgeon to operate on that patient. Right. You're right. Thorough pre-op workup, knowing exactly what you're doing before you get into the operating room, 
mobilizing your team, getting each person as the high, most high volume in that area, best outcomes, proven. I've seen mistakes, which it's hard to understand why, ascites, a mental cake, a gynecologist did a laparoscopy and then referred the patient to me and I said, uh, why did you do laparoscopy? I wanted to see what kind of cancer it was. And he's not a Jew and oncologist. So it, it's being only doing one thing well that I think is going to make the results better. Yeah. I call this the hyper-specialized people. I like in, that. In GYN oncology, which is already about now 50 years old, yeah. I only do surgery. When I was trained to do surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. Right. Well, at that time, maybe there were only six drugs. <laughs> A little bit but, more narrowed scope but back now, then. <laughs> now that there are so many more drugs, genetically individualized chemotherapy, yeah. radiation therapy is totally different. They have proton therapy, high dose brachytherapy, which I was never trained on that thing. So I only do the surgical aspect. Yeah. And there is no other oncology specialty that they do their own chemotherapy. They're wow. breast surgeons. None of them gives chemotherapy. It goes to the medical oncologist. Yeah. Colorectal surgeons, it goes to the oncologist. For us, no. We do our own chemotherapy. Isn't that interesting? It is, absolutely. Even the subspecialties. Mm -hmm. It's happening. That is changing. But it hasn't changed yet. Mm -hmm. Look at the volume of radical hysterectomies by the fellows. Since 1988, the volume of radical hysterectomies has gone down, and it will go down more in the future with the vaccines. Right. To the point that the fellows graduating now, they've done 66% less radical hist than in 1988. Really? 66%. That's remarkable. Yeah. So it means that cervical cancer will have to be done at only a few centers. Mm -hmm. That's going to be done correctly by people that don't enough volume of cases. It's so true that encouraging patients to travel may just be the way we have to deal with this because of just sheer numbers. We'll be right back after this message. So I'm going to shift gears just a touch. I want to talk about privileging and assessment of our fellows, of our residents. So in my personal opinion, the current resident assessments, fellow assessments for surgical skill is subpar. It's not optimized right now. We don't have a good way to assess when someone should graduate, right? Correct. Or it should be credentialed or privileged to do that surgery when they operate. I know you and I were on a mission a couple years back to incorporate video review in assessment. Do you think that would help? So what are your thoughts about video review? Why do you think that's important? in regard to graduation and privileging and things like that? A thousand percent. <laughs> We're on the same page here. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's make the numbers bigger. <laughs> because some individuals believe that, oh, I can do the hysterectomy. But when you watch them operate, you realize there is a lot of need for improvement. So you need coaching. Yes. In one side. On the second, when you look at the graduating residents and they go and take an exam, it's only a written exam. 86% pass. Has anybody, when you were a resident, actually tested your skills in surgery? No. no. I mean, no. FLS, does that count really as you know, extrapolating into the OR for a hard hist? I don't know, so no. But it doesn't even come close to it. It's supposed to perform in the operating room. Doesn't no. test you about anatomy. No. So we we need, based on what you said, yes, video reviews. Mm -hmm. But we also need hand skills evaluation. In my opinion, on first year of medical school, mm -hmm. there are so many things that you do. The simulators that, that we have in our institution, one of them has a, a kidney tumor. Mm -hmm. You got the ultrasound in one hand, mm -hmm. and you got a needle in the other one, you're supposed to put the needle in there. Well, some of them, they do it like very easy, some mm -hmm. other ones cannot hit it. Mm -hmm. So if I could tell already the, not the residents, but the medical students, you are gifted with your hands. Yeah, you need to use these. You, if you like it, exactly, you need to use your hands. If you don't like it, that's different. Mm -hmm. But another one may say, look, you probably would do better because the rest of the people are gonna be better than you. 
do it. Mm -hmm. So the same way that the examinations every year, CREOC exams every year, gives you an idea where you are with the rest of the people. Mm -hmm. If there was a hand skill evaluation, it would tell you if you are high. Like where are you, you at against your peers? You have no idea a lot of times. But the right? video review should be done even on the recertification. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's funny because I, I just changed jobs, right? I recently switched to Cleveland Clinic about yep. six months ago. And during my interview process, I mean, I'm being hired to be a surgeon, right? Yep. Like, that's why they're hiring me is to operate. In the reality of it, they have no idea if I can operate or what kind of surgeon I am, right? And so I had one person ask, you know, can you operate? Are you a good surgeon? I'm like, yeah, I think, yeah, yes, good. I think so, yeah. <laughs> I was trained by Dr. Ted Lee, yeah, I, I am. But I mean, it's just so interesting that even when we hire physicians and uh, there's not even any video review there or just like you said, recertification, I, I agree with you. I think it's instrumental for us to gauge what kind of skill people have. I would very much advocate for 7, 10, 15 minute unedited video submissions to be evaluated. We need assessment scores for cutoffs of passing and not passing. But we also have to be prepared what to do when someone doesn't pass, right? And that's scary. Right, because this has to be a high stakes exam, high stakes review. Absolutely. Yeah. Even with all the objectives that we have now with the laparoscopic lab of the simulator, for instance, mm -hmm. in robotics, you have a percentage of what you do well, percentages of you don't do well. Right. But even we did a study years ago with fourth year residents. We took them to the laboratory and we had three functions, which is you can objectively measure the time. Only time, not quality. Mm -hmm. which was intracorporeal, extracorporeal, and two passes of a continuous suture and a vaginal cuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So the 40-year residents, the, their time, average time to do was 16 minutes. Then we took our fellows, only at the end of one year of fellowship, okay. they did the same functions in 2.48 minutes. Wow. One year, only one year. Wow, a focused training. Right. Wow. So when we did that study years ago is what it brought me to the idea that we need to, almost anybody that wants to do surgery mm -hmm. needs to sub-specialize mm -hmm. if they need to do surgery. Yeah. And you know, you mentioned not having like analytical assessment. You said time is the only thing you can really gauge. You can't gauge. Quality is more difficult to gauge. And so I've been working with Dr. Carla Pugh, who's now out at Stanford for more motion metrics. So you can get analytical data on yeah. you know, dominant hand versus non-dominant hand, idle time, you know, all these different subtle details between expert and novice. And our results are interesting. Hopefully we'll get that manuscript out soon. But the results are interesting and the very subtleties between an expert and a novice with actual analytical data. So Yeah, in robotics they notice that the uh high level surgeon moves the camera continuously. Right. The one that is not a low level surgeon or a beginning, low volume, uh, the camera stays on the same place all the time. So they do the tracking of the movements that yeah. they do and they can tell by the tracking, yep, he knows how to operate, right. uh, the other one could improve. Yep. And, and it's probably because their bandwidth is so maxed out. Like the newer learners, their bandwidth is so maxed out with the task at hand that adding in, moving the camera is putting them over, right? Yeah. So, if I take you back to the training that we were talking about before, yeah. ACGME MIH is 70. Mm -hmm. Laparoscopic, vaginal hysterectomies, or LAVH. So, you have to do 70 to graduate. Okay. LH, VEGHIS, LAVH. If you do an LAVH, it counts as both. It counts as a vaginal and it counts as a laparoscopic, according to the rules or how you count them. One hist gives you two. LABH just counts as the VETCH is the laparoscopic hist. Even with this, in 2017, 51% of the graduating residents were below that number. 51%. Half of our residencies. Half of the residencies were below that number. Now, I'll take you back onto the literature on the learning curved or laparoscopic hysterectomy. Depending on the outcomes that the study looked for, it, it's been rated as number 50 to 90 before you are surgeon. So if you graduate with only 70, you're still in your learning curve. So even that we put a number, it's still not adequate. And that gives you the number, but what you said before is important. What is the quality? Mm -hmm. Right. Because no, uh, number is only one number. It's an objective measurement. But the quality has to be evaluated by video reviews. 
Yeah. I agree. Something needs to change. Something. This is not sustainable. It's. it's I'm not. in a thousand percent agreement on that one, <laughs> Cara. <laughs> But you're right, and I don't know if coaching is going to help bridge us for a bit, or, I mean, because even, even if we separate obstetrics from gynecology, if that happens, yeah. it's not soon. Like, it's not within the next couple of years. Do you agree? I totally agree. But you don't have to separate OB from GYN in the sense of American colleges splitting apart. No, you don't have to do that. Yeah. What you have to do is says the training has to be directed to OB, or the training is going to have to be directed to GYN. And within OB, for instance, you are going to be taking care of only pregnancies. Right. You are going to be a surgical OB doing the cesarean sections, doing complicated all the deliveries. Mm -hmm. So OB could be medical, it could be surgical. Yeah. The same way that GYN has to be medical and, and surgical. Yeah. If we take this concept, I think we are taking one step forward, and then we'll see how we shape the rest of the separation. Mm -hmm. But they are individuals that they only practice medical GYN already right. in private practice, and they are doing very well. Right. And other ones that they are pra practicing primarily surgery are mixed fellows. I hope that that's what they're going to do, practice surgery high volume and raised up the standard of surgery in whatever community they work in. It's, yeah. that's, it's a very good point, is we, that we can start small small steps now, form these GYN champions within groups, yeah, make we, those the GYN We surgeons. are indebted to women. We are the only specialty that is fully dedicated exclusively to women. So let's give women the best care that we can. I want to switch gears again and talk to you about your mentorship award and your career a little bit. So your career has been absolutely amazing. You are a role model to so many learners and colleagues, surgeons, OBGYNs in general, people outside OBGYN. Thank you. 100%, yes. So in your opinion, what makes a great mentor? What characteristics do you think really exemplify an amazing mentor? To me, a mentor is a person that not only shows me in surgery put your hand this way, rotate the instrument this way, and your stitches are going to be better than the other one. No. It's a person that says, look, this is how you're supposed to see the patient. It's not a disease you're treating. You're treating a human being that has a disease with all the complexities of that person. That person background can be very different from a rural area to an executive woman. You need to address this person differently. Then you need to know how to review the literature, teach you how to review what's important and what's not important, and then prepare you to be a mentor for other people. Mm -hmm. To me, the mentor is not only the, per the person that helps you surgically or whatever you want to excel, but it takes care of a whole you, of your mind, and coaches in your mind how to practice medicine. To me, that's a real mentor. Wow, that's amazing. You know, it's like a, a coaching in soccer. Yes. Sure, they can teach you exactly how to kick the ball and see like this, but a good coach will teach you that you are only one member of the team. True. That the team is more important than you, and that you have to support everybody that is in your team. So a mentor in surgery says, hey, everybody in the operating room is as important as you are, because you cannot do it without them. You're supposed to help them when they need your help, the same way they do it with you. So you work with them, they don't work for you. To me, that's the concept mm -hmm. of a real mentor, mm -hmm. that it teaches you more about life, because the mentor is gonna be usually somebody who's older, True. and may have a little more wisdom or experience, that things that you learned, things that you've done wrong, and you want to, hey, don't do this mistake, I've done it. Avoid this, they it don't hurts. Work, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. We appreciate you going through those things for us. Yes. But you're right. When a surgery goes well, it's your team making that happen, right? When a surgery yeah. feels really good, it's because your assistant was on. They had all the equipment that they need. Your anesthesiologist has everything optimized up top. It's, it's the team when things feel good. Yeah. Uh, something is My operating room, if you walk into an operating room and you ask, what's the philosophy of the surgeon? They don't know it. There is no team. Mm -hmm. You come to my operating room and say, okay, what's... What does this guy say all the time? No excuses. <laughs> Is that your line? That's my line. 
No excuses. I Everybody knows it. Why? Because the day that you don't have any excuse, you accept all your responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. There's no excuse for forgetting something. We have a human being with a disease mm -hmm. that unfortunately has to have surgery, and we want to make the labor the best possible care. So when you, when you push this every day, every day, every day, the people that work with you, they are on the same mode. Mm -hmm. The entire bar is raised. Right. So you have yeah. to have a team that all work under the same philosophy. Mm -hmm. Pushing themselves to the edge to continue to get better. Correct. Right? Yeah. It's true. Who is your most influential mentor? Uh, when I was a resident, it was a GYN surgeon, Dick Simmons, mm -hmm. who saw patients as what I thought a role model should do it. Mm -hmm. In medical school, was a gynecologist in Barcelona. That was also a role model for me. In uh, GYN Oncology Fellowship uh, was Jack Masterson, who taught me a lot of things outside of the operating room that I had yeah. never learned. Nobody had ever done it to follow me. And then ever since then, I've been mentored by everybody in this room, probably. <laughs> right, right. Because everybody has something that I can take from them. Yeah. So I, I when I go to meetings like this, I... I kind of joking says I steal energy from people yes meaning I learned something from that person that I'm taking with me that I'm I want to be like that person doing this yeah but that doesn't mean in surgery or doing the video it means delivering a speech being a moderator yeah addressing an issue etc right like you I wish I could be like you right now oh my gosh stop it you should be on TV stop it stop it <laughs> My goodness, I value your time so much. So, what makes a good mentee? So, what what kind of mentee do to enhance their their relationship with their mentor? Does that make sense? Yes, there has to be a community of objectives. Uh, frequently, I will ask one of the fellows when they come and they join us after they've been two or three months with us, "What's your goal? Okay, I want to excel in surgery. Okay, what have you done?" show me the list of things you want to do that you've done already to be like this. They don't have it. Right. They, they want to excel. That's why they take it the F mix. But they don't know how to. Right. And then you have to teach them. If I meet with them and I said you're supposed to do A, B, for instance, something very easy. Write down all the procedures you do step by step until you have a video in your head. You give them all the steps but they don't do them. Mm -hmm that is not going to be a good mentee. Mm -hmm. But if you have somebody that says, and that's the steps that you are suggesting to do, mm -hmm. then you know that they are going to excel. Mm -hmm. And it, you know that doesn't take very long. No, right? I know. So for me, that mental model, you're, those steps are so crucial. For me, that mental model when you're out of the operating room, so when you're in there, it comes easy. Your bandwidth isn't maxed out by things that you could optimize outside the OR. I, it's, yes. it's, a, it's a good suggestion. Yeah. So you're saying schedule frequent meetings with your mentor. That'd be a good mentee. And then listen to them. Oh, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Listen to them and do those action items. Correct. I yeah. mean, I still remember the mentors telling me something in the past, and I'm going like, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. Because I believe they were good role models. Mm -hmm. They were practicing this, and I wanted to be like one of them. It's mm -hmm. like you have the desire to excel to the best that you can but you cannot do it by yourself. It can be overwhelming, right? As a new fellow coming into Mayo Clinic, Arizona under Dr. Javier Magrina, oh my goodness, that'd be so intimidating, right? I hope not. Well, I mean, you make it, I'm sure, comfortable, but you're, you're a legacy. So breaking that down into obtainable action items, though, I could see how that could make a big difference and making something seem really overwhelming, obtainable, right. because you have very specific steps on how to get it there. Takes, it takes patience. You have to tell them, look, you are not going to grow and achieve this in two days, only three days. Right. Oh, I want to practice every day in the laboratory. No. 20 minutes at a time, twice a week, mm -hmm. continuously during two years, you're going to be better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. It's like you don't run a marathon every day, right? No, no. So you don't go to the lab three hours a day because right. you're going to overkill yourself. Right. You do this. Second, you have perseverance. Perseverance means, hey, this is not coming out. I'm never going to get there. No. The minute that you say never, you will not. 
Right. So you always said that you can do it, persevere, and then practice. I call it the three P's. <laughs> Patience, perseverance, and practice. Brilliant. And then you will excel. But you have to put the time in. Yeah, correct. You have to put the time in with deliberate practice. Yeah, those are good recommendations. Question for you again. So mentorship versus sponsorship. It's subtly different, but different. And I believe that you are a, a amazing in both avenues. But being a sponsor, I think, is a little bit different than being a mentor. What are your thoughts about the difference between those two? I think a spon sponsor is more of a one objective. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sponsor you for A. Mm -hmm. Mentorship, I'm going to mentor you for A, B, C, D, E, G, and F until I know that you have acquired enough that then when you get at that level, you're going to be my mentor. <laughs> We're going to flip roles. <laughs> S simply because the, the young people have a different mentality. Yeah. They see things differently, and I want to learn from that. So some of the trainees that I have, even during the fellowship, become mentors. They're teaching me things that I cannot see it. So mentor and mentee, that. sometimes the, 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 the role can change. And a sponsor, I think, is for one specific item, which I think would be insufficient to be a mentor for only one thing, that's a sponsor. I see. I, yeah, I like your differentiation. And in, when you, your speech, when you accepted the John Stegi Award, it hit me, it resonated with me. It was a really beautiful speech in that, you know, you dedicated the award to your fellows, to your learners, and you said something about, my goals make them better than me. And it was just, it really resonated with me in that you are there truly for your learners to make them exceed and, um, and make them better than you. It's just, it's, it was a really, it was a thoughtful and Thank meaningful you. statement. Thank you. It was heartfelt. Yeah, I, we all felt it. Yeah. It, that award cannot go to a better person. So I'm really happy. Yeah. If you could offer one piece of advice to a new doc graduating, it could be a fellow or a, or a generalist, what one piece of advice would you give to that new grad? The knowledge is so extensive. The number of procedures are so extensive. I would ask them, I said, okay, think about first, what do you have inside of you? We all have two different things in life and you don't know what it's coming from. I was the first one, my first physician in my family. There was no other physicians before. And I worked at the manufacturing of my dad for years during the summers, but I, did, I was not gonna be there. Yeah. So my desire was to do, at age 12, I had a desire already to be doing something with my hands in patients. So I wanted to be a surgeon at a young age. You knew it. Where does it come from? Yeah. We're all made of the same carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Yeah. And we all have different things and different specialties. So you have something that comes from inside of you. Yeah. That would be number one. What is it that you really see yourself doing? Yeah. That, and that's the best advice, that is not work something that you can do it 24 hours a day and you will never get tired of doing. In other words, you're never going to work a day in your life. So yeah. choose something like this. If you want to work with your hands like I did, do something that you're going to have to use your hands. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have, use your mind, and, and to me the internists are incredible people because they put a signature on a paper, they give a medication to a person and they cure the disease, right. or they maintain the chronic disease for life. True. So find out what is your passion or dream or desire, something you feel inclined to do. Mm -hmm. And then don't do 20 things. <laughs> it's hard to say no sometimes. Do, <laughs> yes. do only one, yeah. do it well, and yeah. excel on doing it, you know? Yeah, no, I, I like that. Find the work that doesn't feel like work. Yeah, yeah. something like you. <laughs> I have a lot do of fun. Do the mixed fellowship. Yeah. yeah, I have a lot of fun, I'll be honest. Yeah. So thank you so much, Dr. McGreen. I appreciate your time this morning. I, I really, really You're appreciate welcome. you. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. All right, so we have a few people here listening to our podcast this morning, and I am curious of their opinion. So introduce yourself. Who, who are you this morning? Good morning. My name is Paran Malagzade, and I am a third-year resident at the University of Tennessee in Memphis. Amazing. Thank you for joining us this morning. So... In your opinion, do you think obstetrics should be separated from GYN, or do you think that it should stay together? I think that 
Um, at my level of training, I am graduating with the hopes of applying to minimally invasive gynecology, not just because I do love the surgical aspect of our field, but because I don't feel prepared graduating um, and operating on a patient without a partner that's invested in me 100%. And I think that reflects a little bit about our training in general. Like you had mentioned earlier, we do have to not only master the OB medical aspect, but we also have to master the surgical aspect of OB and then switch gears and master the GYN medical and the surgical aspect. And so there's a lot that's crammed into four years. And I just, you know, Malcolm Gladwell says it best, you need 10,000 hours to become a master and we are not graduating to become masters. And so, um, yes, they can increase the laparoscopic numbers that we need. Yes, they can do all the tests that you had mentioned previously, but ultimately I think there needs to be some change at the level, at the root, that prepares us to be excellent providers um, in whatever field that we choose and not just pursue careers just because we don't feel comfortable operating. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Cano. How are you? I'm very good. So where are you coming from today? I practice in Canada, in Alberta. So today, Dr. Mangreen and I have been talking about the possibility of separating obstetrics from gynecology in the training programs. What are your thoughts about that? So in my early career, I'm from, I was, I graduated in Argentina and I did my first residency training there where it was combined and it was obstetrics and gynecology where obstetrics is dominating because of the volume, the learning curve on that was pretty easy to obtain. Right. Meanwhile, gynecology was left for a post-call physician, tired, exhausted, and probably not well prepared. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I did all the vaginal hysterectomies and total abdominal hysterectomies then. And then I moved and did a residency program at Ohio State University Medical Center. Of course, I already had mastered my obstetrics and I focus on my GYN. Over there, I can say I really learned because I would stay there. I would put my hours, interest, and I wasn't so drained from the, from the obstetrics where I could really learn some gynecology. When I graduated, I still didn't feel that I could perform some of the surgeries alone and with increasing knowledge, I couldn't master uh, doing a simple hysterectomy by total abdominal approach versus vaginal approach versus robotic approach because that would, came out in 2005 right. versus your laparoscopic approach. Right. So I doubted in doing an MIS fellowship because now I felt like after two residency training programs I still wasn't ready to do a hysterectomy which is the most critical simple procedure like uh, that what we do. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. So then, uh, one of my attendants said, "You probably need to move to um, to a larger, like a place where they do MIS and just start practicing and learning and your mentors." Then I moved to a place that we had pretty pretty good volume for gynecology, and I still was in Canada. It's quite hard not to do obstetrics, and so I started doing some research in how this could be separated. And the first thing I learned it was in the Cleveland Clinic. I think they were trying to do where residents could actually start like doing elective. So Tracking. basically, basically, you're, 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 it, it would look like an elective, like all the way. And if you're because most attendants would say it was a waste if you do if you do teach someone a gynecology surgery and they're doing MFM. I mean, so I do believe strongly that this should be separated, and also in clinical practice, not only in like in, le in, in the learning curve. My name is Luis Gonzalez. Where are you coming from? I'm coming from um, uh, Michigan. Now I am in the Indiana area, Warsaw, Indiana. Oh, excellent. USA. <laughs> excellent. It's nice to have you today. So Dr. Mangreen and I have spent the morning talking about the possibility of separating obstetrics and gynecology in the residency. What are your thoughts about separating the O from the G? I think it's commonsensical because the uh, time a lot of for training, especially for the newer trainees, is, is too small for a proper training on techniques, of variable techniques of uh, gynecology. Most of our hospitals are going to train people because of the OB. Right. Because that's how they pay money. It's funny, they say we don't make any money in OB, but every delivery, every anesthesia, every epidural, every pediatrician. Money's coming in. Money's coming. However, the, what happens is that uh, the old fashioned trend was the older member of the group will do so many years of obstetrics and then he will say, I just don't win gynecology. Nowadays, that's not something that hospitals and much of us are employed. 
Right. So we cannot just call you shot and say, I just want to do robotics or I just want to do endoscopy. Right. Uh, only if you move it to the office. So people like me who graduated way back in 1986, I took every other course there is, Dr. Magrina knows because it was one of the early <laughs> mentors, uh, yeah. on robotics and hysteroscopy and uh, all things gynecology because at a certain time, you already know how to do a C-section in 15, 20 minutes. Right. Do delivery, forceps, or whatever you need to do. Right. That's not something that needs a lot of depuration. That probably you are going to be okay in the first year or two after you graduate. Mm -hmm. However, gynecology, moving parts of all these procedures, you have to learn in a painstaking, repetitious way. Right. If you don't do it every day and you don't take courses, you're going to be not in good shape. So it will be a good idea to just do away with the nonsense that you can be a jack of all trades right. and just do uh, a track for gynecology versus ob obstetrics. I just found Dr. Pasek, the program director of Louisville. Hello. Yes, hello, how are you? Good morning, we're Good great. Good to see you. You too. So right now, we are diving into the question if obstetrics should be separated from gynecology in residency. What do you think? I definitely agree. Although we are all dealing with women's health, there are two such different areas, obstetrics and gynecology. This way, right now, our residents go to four years of training. They get out of the training, and they're not really very good surgeons. And the majority of them, they don't really have a full capacity to do complex gynecological cases. And they're just kind of delivering babies. And after that, they have to go to subspecialized training. So if we separated those two areas, the training would definitely be shorter for gynecology because right now reality is whoever goes into these gynecological subspecialties such as minimally invasive surgery or they go to urogynecology or oncology they're never going to deliver babies That's the reality so if you it, look right? at it it's like really four years of kind of almost wasted time mm -hmm. it should be maybe two years of kind of general training and then separation of specialties and basically maybe even go to a five-year training all together where there will be people who just deal with pregnancy mm -hmm. and those that deal with gynecological issues. If we separate out, separate out the training, how is that going to impact more rural settings where they may be having difficulty just finding general OBGYNs right now? That is going to be challenging, probably for the rural settings, but now we are so connected in today's world. And uh, we have a training for, for common training where they will do two years of OBGYN and then kind of decide in right. what area to go that will uh, even help the rural areas, in my opinion. Right, elevate the, elevate the care there, right? Yes, Better definitely. patient outcomes. That is true. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Pasek. Thanks. I appreciate your time this morning. And that's all for this episode of Gynecologic Surgeons Unscrubbed. Join us next episode for more expert insights and perspectives. From all of us at MD Edge and the Society of Gynecologic Surgeons, thanks for listening.